Well, good morning, Trip. How you doing? Man, I love that story of Netsanet and baptism. I am excited next Sunday for water baptisms on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. My middle son, Jackson, is getting baptized next Sunday, and it's going to be awesome. So I just want to give another plug. Some of you, you thought that was it. Finally, I can get past this moment. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Take this step. It's always good to take steps of obedience. Do not ever minimize or downplay obedience. I think that's the theme and just want to share that with you. Well, welcome today. We are studying Genesis this year and oh, how I have enjoyed it. Hope you have as well. Uh, Our podcast is also moving alongside these Sunday morning teachings and we just launched one this last week and oh man, I was fired up. I must have had a Red Bull before I got into it. And so today I'm fired up as well. Honestly, this is one of those messages I've had on my calendar for over three months. I have known that this text is coming. I have been waiting for it. I have been thinking about it. And so I am just so delighted to share it with you. I think it's going to be encouraging. It's going to be helpful. I hope that you see the truth today about who our God is. That opening song, he saves us. He loves us. This is who he is. This is what he does. It's what he's been doing from the very beginning. Today is Palm Sunday. As many of you know, it's the beginning of Holy Week or the week of Christ's passion. This leads us up to Good Friday, which we have a gathering planned here this Friday night. That's going to be a wonderful time of worship and participation with crosses and nailing sin to the cross. I'm going to preach on the seven capital vices. You just, of course you want to be here for that. It's going to be great. And we're going to worship, extended time of prayer and worship. It's going to be a wonderful night. Uh, Of course, this culminates in the resurrection of Christ on Sunday, which is why we gather as the people of God on Sunday. And the church has for 2,000 years. And of course, Palm Sunday, if you're not familiar, today we're in Genesis. I'm not going to preach the particular Palm Sunday text. I've done that in the past. If you're curious to hear a traditional Palm Sunday sermon, go check one out from a couple years ago in John. We, we did that. Um, but I want to remind you of what Palm Sunday is about. Palm Sunday is the day where we celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem, the holy city, on a donkey, and people say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes to save us. Hosanna. They're like, here he comes. Some could see it, some couldn't see it. Nobody really saw it the way it was going to go down, which their salvation was going to look like the death of the Lord, the death of God in our place. But Jesus enters into the city to save. In the same way, we're going to be in the Garden of Eden. And what you're going to read today, hear me read today, is God enters into a garden to save. And Adam and Eve didn't know it. It is not what they thought was coming. But God enters into the garden in order to save. And of course, this is fully culminated and expressed in God in Christ entering human flesh and coming into our existence, our time and space, living our life and dying our death so that we might be saved from our one true enemy, sin, Satan, death, the grave, and God bringing redemption to our lives. Here we're going to see in Genesis chapter 3, God enters the garden looking to save Adam and Eve after we just saw last week. Thank you, Jesse, for that wonderful message. Humanity submit themselves to the serpent. They bought the lies. They missed the distortion. They became deceived. And they disobeyed God's explicit commands and reaped the consequence. The immediate consequence was shame. I am now naked. I have lost my innocence. And here we see in our next section of Scripture exactly what God does when that kind of thing happens. When it happened, a real event, but also as it continues to happen. I have an ambitious title to my message today. Here's what I'm calling it. The three most important questions ever. The three most important questions ever of all time. Ryan, how could you say that? Because we're going to look at a dialogue. The dialogue between God and humanity when humanity in shame and sin disobeyed God and hid from him. This story is a real event in history. 
This story is also archetypal in its influence. It is still being played out over and over and over in your life and in my life. So I hope today you will answer the three most important questions ever. Let's pray and jump into the text. Father, we come before you so grateful, so thankful, so humbled that we are sinners saved by grace, that we have been translated from darkness into light, that you see us, you know our name, you have called us saints, and yet you still pursue us even when we wander, even when we stray. This is who you are. Help us see the character of God today in clarity, in all of your majesty and wonder how you unceasingly pursue us. God, I ask that you would, by your spirit, draw people to yourself today. Whether the first time or the thousandth time, we need to find our way back to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 3, we're going to read verses 8 through 13. Now remember, again, Jesse did a wonderful job last week showing us the serpent shows up in the garden. This is both an animal but a spirit being bigger and beyond the animal. There's a mystery to that we don't quite fully understand, but we know it's not just an animal. This animal's talking, and this animal's talking with Eve, and it moves from lies and doubt to distortion to deception to destruction. All of this occurs, and as soon as it happens and they eat the fruit of which God said they should not eat, they knew they were naked, and they were ashamed, so they sowed leaves to cover themselves, and they hide. Here's the very next thing that happens. Verse 8, and then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They sinned, and what does God do? Comes near. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Adam responded and said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat? The man said, classic, the woman. (laughs) Classic. The woman you gave me, it's my wife. It's her. She gave me the fruit of the tree. And then here's a small admission of responsibility. And I ate. Before, ladies, you think it's just us men who have it bad. Well, let's read your response. Then the Lord God turned and said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent. The serpent deceived me. And then a small admission of responsibility, and I ate. I'm going to stop right there. Like, man, Ryan, that's that's not a lot of scripture for you. It's not, because I'm just bursting in my heart to share this with you. I want you to see three things that are very clear in the text that teach us about who God is. Let me just help you with this. When you read the Bible, because you should read the Bible, I should not be the only time you read the Bible. That isn't good for you. You will not make it long-term in Christian discipleship if you only depend on your church or the preacher to read the Bible, and that's when you hear, listen, and wrestle with the Bible. That was a side note. I just feeling fired up today. <laughs> but here's the deal. This, this text, when we read it, Last week, a lot of what I would say is the appropriate interpretation application is, what is this text showing us about humanity? We're prone to doubt. We're prone to deception. We're prone to disobedience. It's easy for us to to think false things that God's holding out on us, and then it becomes the substructure from which we engage in rebellion against the authority of God. That's just huge. This portion of the text, the key question is, what is this showing us about God? 
And I want you to see this here. Here's the first observation I want you to see. God comes near to the broken and ashamed. Many of us think that God, yes, he's holy. He's absolutely holy. But we imagine somehow that God can't get near sinners. Can I announce to you that the entire truth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God putting on flesh, is that God has always been the type of being who comes near to the sinful because he loves. He loves you. He loves me. He loves Adam. He loves Eve. He doesn't stand afar off, distant and uninterested. As was his custom, I'm sure, he came strolling into the garden for another midday walk and talk with his image bearers. But it's not like he was surprised, like, I wonder where they're going to be today. I wonder what may have just happened. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. So even knowing they were hiding, even knowing they were naked, knowing they were ashamed, knowing they were broken, he still comes near. This is so important. And Romans 5, 8 echoes this for us in the New Testament. While we were yet sinners, God shows his mercy for us in this, that Christ died for us. God comes near to the broken and ashamed. The magnitude of implication of this little note in Genesis 3 screams that our God, the one true, holy, transcendent creator of all, wants to walk and talk with his creation. And listen, he will get what he wants. The picture of the eschaton, the end of things, is our God walks with us and amongst us and he knows us and we know him and we enjoy him for the rest of eternity. We are not seeing here any shade of an absentee, disinterested God. What you see here from the very beginning, even with the most heinous of sin, is God draws near. Some of you, you need to hear this today. This Palm Sunday, you are keenly aware of your brokenness. You are trying to manage your own shame. And I want you to know, God is coming near to you. Right here, right now. The second thing from this text that I want you to see is the broken hide from God and from each other. This is what broken, sinful humanity does. Adam and Eve did it. We do it to this day. Adam and Eve knew that the sound of that walking was God. They knew it was about time for the midday walk and talk with Yahweh. And so what did they do? They hid themselves from him. Don't miss this though. Verse 7 says they hid themselves from each other. The first move was covering their own nakedness. I don't want to know you as intimately as I used to know you. You don't want to know me as intimately as you used to know me. And now we don't want to know God as God intimately wants to know us and as we once knew him. This is what we do. This is the nature and consequence and function of sin and rebellion and disorder in God's good and perfect world. They sewed fig leaves for themselves to cover their shame and their nakedness. So please hear me, friends. The impulse to hide is as old as the Garden of Eden itself. And we tend to think that there's safety in the dark, but the truth is, please listen, there is only safety where God is. See, I want to change this. Listen, listen. There's not safety in the dark. We tend to think there is. So what's the opposite, the antidote of that. In the light, that's true, but I want to specify the light. It is not just merely there is safety in the light and not the dark. It's there is safety where God is. Some of you need your mental furniture rearranged. You don't think God's safe. This text is screaming, he's safe. 
but he judges. He does. We'll look at that next Sunday. <laughs> Fired up about it. It fell, the text fell in such a beautiful way for me to preach Genesis 3.15 on Resurrection Sunday. Oh man, I can't, I gotta stop. I'll spoil it. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Here's what I want you to think about. Safety is where God is. Here's a New Testament illustration. Peter, come out and walk on the water. I ain't stupid. It's not safe to walk on water. It is if that's where God is. Safety is where God is. Because God wants relationship. He comes near to the broken, the ashamed, and we tend to hide from each other and hide from him, and we think we're safe in our hiding. But the truth is, safety is where God is. It's where God is calling us. That's where we experience safety, because anything else we feel safe in and a refuge in apart from God is a mirage. It's soon gone. Whether it's your bank account, it's your ego, your reputation, your performance, your job, your marriage, your children, your successes. I feel good there. I feel safe there. Whew. It's a mirage. Third thing I want you to see in this text is God calls out to the broken and ashamed. He doesn't just draw near. He calls out. He not only comes close to walk with Adam and Eve in their worst possible moment, he calls to them. And let me ask you this question. It's not a trick question. Do you think God is asking questions because God is needing answers? Let me help you. Where are you? I can't seem to find you. My GPS is broken. I'm not sure what tree you're hiding behind, Adam. Where are you? He... <laughs> God's asking questions to condescend, to relate to us. He's not asking questions because he needs answers. What God is doing is he's illustrating his response to brokenness and, sh and sin and shame. And you know what it is? It's pursuit. It's pursuit. Last week, we saw the slithering serpent, snake, Satan, expose the vulnerability of humanity this week, we see God pursue and heal and redeem the broken and shamed humanity. And God does it by asking three questions. Now, again, uh, I, this is an actual event. There was an actual fall. There was an initial human sin. This is it. The scriptures record it. But the, also, these three questions that God asks, I think, are a powerful map for our lives. And I want to get to those three questions. Here's the first one. Where are you? Where are you? What does God say when he comes into the garden for a stroll? He says, where are you? Now, God's not asking this question because he's uncertain where Adam or Eve are hiding. Here's the truth, friends. Where we go and what we turn to in times of distress, pain, Confusion, fear, and failure reveals that which we trust the most. I'm going to say this again. Where you go, what you turn to, what substance, what distraction, what relationship, what mental map, what behavior, what habit, what practice, what you turn to when you're stressed out, afraid, in pain, confused, or have recently failed, this reveals your trust structure. And Adam and Eve, their trust structure was obedience to Yahweh and enjoying his relationship and the perfect garden he made for them, enjoying one another in community and working towards the creation mandate of subduing all the earth that it may give glory to God as they rule over it. Started in the garden, was going to work its way all around the globe. And when they sin, it wasn't just oopsies. We did an oopsies. Their trust structure shifted. They no longer trust Yahweh. They trusted the serpent and themselves. And here's the proof. They go to the bushes. 
to the trees, to their hiding place. And so what's the first question God asks? Where are you? Not because he couldn't see through the bushes. It's like, I see you, Adam. I see you, Eve. You guys aren't even together anymore. I got it. Hey, where are you? He asks them because he wants them to own up where they are. Let me ask you this question. Today, where are you? Where am I? Here's a, here's a way to think about it. What does the fig leaf, quote unquote, that you've been sowing, what does the tree that you're choosing to hide behind show what you trust most? What do you cling to in life in order to bring your sense of self-salvation? Listen, friends, we're in Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, and the announcement that God is the only one who can sufficiently save sinners is what this entire week is about. And here's the deal. You might think the message of the gospel, that Christ Jesus died, rose again, and ascended for the sake of sinners, that they might believe in him and have life, is rote and boring and something you learn when you were five. I want you to know you and I are addicted to self-salvation. Adam and Eve did it from day one, and so are we. We're trying to find things that'll make us feel safe, and they'll make us feel secure. Whether it's our little fig leaf or the big tree we think we're hiding behind, the question God asks us is paramount. Where are you? Are you willing to admit what you're trusting isn't sufficiently replacing me? Are you willing? This question reveals how badly we need community and relationship and accountability because we are so often easily self-deceived. We need brothers and sisters to ask us, where are you? What's happening? Do you recognize what's happening? Do you know where you are today? Spiritually speaking, please, please listen to this. this. This was a quote. It's been sitting here for a while and I thought about it deeply and I want to say it slowly because I think it's important. The issue here about where are you is not just about hiding from God. It's about what we're hiding with as we're hiding from God. Does that make sense? What are you using to hide from God? Adam and Eve were using trees and leaves. What are we using to hide from God? When I was a kid, I had a blankie. Anybody? I'm not here to rail on blankies. Blankies are great. I wish I had a picture of my blankie. It was like a two, it's just weird because I was small. It was a kid, it's like two feet by two feet. It's like yellow, tattered. I mean, honestly, if I saw it today, I'd probably throw up. It's gross. <laughs> it's just gross. I don't know where it is. Maybe my mom has it in a keepsake box. Maybe she burned it in a dumpster. I'm not sure. But if you're like me, you can maybe remember this blankie. It's this artifact. It's this thing that you carry with you for some time because the truth is, in our natural sense, it brings us a sense of consolation, a sense of comfort, a sense of safety. It's something that emotionally and psychologically reinforces us. If I think hard enough, and this is kind of weird, but just go with me, I can still see it, feel it, and smell it. I can smell my blanket. I bring this point up because maybe you can relate, and I'm trying to illustrate something not about blankies or childhood psychology. I'm trying to illustrate something about our need for refuge and security and safety. And I'm trying to announce to you that that spot deserves to be filled with God alone. Now, don't go home and take your kids' blankies away, okay? Listen. <laughs> From a spiritual perspective, God deserves that spot. God is fit for that spot. And even more amazingly than God deserving it or being fit for it, please hear this. He wants it. Isn't that beautiful? God wants to be your refuge. When he says, where are you? He wants you to know he delights in your answer being, I am in Christ. This is the ultimate hope. This is all 
moving towards. The second thing that God asks, he says, where are you? What are you using to hide with? The second thing he asks them when he confronts them, he says, who told you that? Adam responds, and he has a pretty decent answer. He's like, well, here's the deal. I'm hiding from you because I'm naked. What he doesn't say is, I've come up with my own self-salvation project. Aren't you proud, Yahweh? Look at these leaves. (laughs) And I hid from you. The next thing God asked, because he says he was naked, he says, who told you that? God asked this profound question. It's so profound, it still needs to be asked. And I would say this question, yes, asked literally in the garden at the fall, but also it's asked again and again because there's constantly a war over the word in every generation. In other words, who gets to define reality? That's the question. Adam says, I'm naked. God says, Who told you you were naked? Well, my feelings. The serpent. The question God asks isn't, let's debate your feelings. The question is, where'd those come from? Who told you that? In other words, the question here, this second question, it is so important, and this question rages in every generation, and it's certainly raging in ours, and here's why it rages in every generation, because the devil, his primary mode of operation is spiritual warfare that is around the issue of truth and reality. What is true? What is real? This is the fundamental question because, listen, you and I live our lives out of the well of our thoughts and our feelings. The way we think and the way we feel is the way we live. And so what Adam and Eve thought before the serpent was, God is good. The garden is beautiful. I am taken care of. There are a multiple amount of trees I can eat from. The gold, the awnings is beautiful. The mission is clear. The relationship is wonderful. This is incredible. This is reality. What does the serpent do? No, it's not. God's holding out on you. There's another reality that you're missing. The deception comes because there's a war over truth. There's a war over the word, the word of God or the word of a fallen being, proud and sinful. And this war is the determining factor of your beliefs. Your beliefs are the battleground of your life. Not just your behaviors, not just your whatever you're doing out here and whatever everyone can see or your job or your relationships. The battle of your life is the war over belief in your soul. Who is God? What has he said? Is he good? Is he faithful? Did he die for me? Did he rise for me? Will he come again for me? These beliefs are the battle the enemy is waging. And we must stand in truth. And the way we do this is we answer God's question. Satan told me that. And I reject that. I want to live in what you have told me. This is why truth matters. This is why, please hear me, I mentioned what I mentioned about Bible reading. Why should Christians read their Bible? Because I want to constantly be checking, who told me that? Who told me that? Who told me this is the good life? Who told me I have to have that? Who told me I can't start again? Who told me? Where did this come from? This is the task of preaching. It makes sense this would fire me up because literally most Sundays of the year, I stand in a pulpit and contend for this one question. Who told you that? Who told you that that was true? Who told you you can't be forgiven? Who told you God was like that? Who told you it's over? Who told you you can do whatever you want? Who told you you can become your own God? Who told you you can create your own reality? Who told you that? 
It is literally the job of the preacher. It is the power of the scripture. It is the responsibility of the church to constantly check ourselves. And this is not a new thing. This is something God's been after from the garden. Who told you that? His first question, what leaves are you using to hide yourself from the fact that you need me? What's your leaves? What, what, where's your tree? What false gospel do you believe that keeps you from wanting to ask the deeper question? Once you identify that, now come close. Who told you that? Who told you that? This is the powerful question. And every time we ask it, here's what we're doing. Romans 12.1. We're renewing our mind. We're not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And slowly but surely, we're rearranging our beliefs to look like what God wants them to look. And then slowly but surely, our thoughts and our feelings flow with those beliefs and our behaviors begin to glorify God and experience God's grace and goodness. The third question, what does God do? He says, what have you done? Three questions. Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? I love this question. It's the simplest one. It's the most forward. What have you done? Oh, uh, now look at, look at Adam and Eve's response. I, they are encouraging and challenging because we see ourselves, don't we? I know I do. I also want to ask you a really important question here with, with these questions. Like dreams within dreams. <laughs> Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? Here's the question I want to ask all of us. What tone do you hear with those questions? Where are you? Scared some of you. <laughs> I saw the jump. Do you hear that? Like, is that what you hear? Where are you? Who told you that? Do you hear that tone? Do you hear what have you done? What tone do you hear? This is really important because I think this is where we start to create pictures in our mind of how God is approaching us. Here's what I want you to see. I do not think this is an angry, disappointed tone from God. I actually think it's an invitational come near. Who told you that? What have you done? Where are you? That's the tone. This matters because this determines if we think God is actually interested in us or if he's simply interested in order in his world. Let me help you with this. He is interested in order in his world, but not at the exclusion of you or me. He's interested in you. He's interested. He is, he is pursuing Adam and Eve. This is the pinnacle moment of the story. Here is the climax. The question is, will Adam and Eve step into the light where God is? Will they choose that where God is, there is safety? Yahweh, here is what we have done. Or will they spin it? What do they do? They spin it. There's partial confession, but it's mostly spun. Let me read it to you. It's quite interesting. What did you do? Did you eat the fruit? The man says, the woman. I mean, before I admit what I did, let's blame someone else first. It's my parents. It's this person. It's that person. It's my upbringing. It's my city. It's my community. It's my nation. It's my this. It's my that. It's blame. It's classic. What did you do? Well, the woman, I said, what did you do? Oh, yeah, well, after that I ate. <laughs> the woman, what did you do? Well, the serpent. Uh, after that I ate. It's this halvesy confession. Here's what I want you to see. Before God brings judgment, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, I'm going to go through Genesis 3, 15, all the way through the rest of the chapter, and it's the judgment of God on the snake, on the man, on the woman. Hiding within this judgment is literally the first prophetic announcement of Jesus Christ. 
What a great text for Easter. But I want you to see this. Before God brings righteous, truthful judgment, what's he after? Humble, honest confession. Why? Because he's not just interested in a righteous, ordered world. He's interested in redeeming the broken and ashamed that are caught within it. Here's the main takeaway. Here's the heartbeat of Genesis 3, 8 through 14. God pursues us all and he is inviting confession. He is inviting confession. Please listen. A life of confession is a life of humble agreement with God. Some of you might feel like, what does that mean? God's inviting confession. Like that sounds religious and like I don't follow the language. A life of confession, when God invites it from us, when we confess, we agree with God. We say, I agree and I will participate in the most important questions ever. Hear me now. And I will participate honestly and humbly in confession with these questions the rest of my life. Friend, the first time you experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, these questions were happening. Maybe not overtly, but they were happening. God, by the power of his spirit, by the power of the scripture, by someone sharing their faith with you or announcing the truth of the gospel, what was happening was this. You were becoming aware of where you are. And you were saying, I don't like this addiction. I don't like this hopelessness. I don't like this this guilt. I don't like this anxiety. I'm trying to perform my way into goodness. I don't like this. I'm recognizing my trust structure, what I'm holding. I don't like this. I now know where I am. And then you repent. It's just getting, letting that go, turning towards God. And then the second thing's occurring. Who told you that? What truth are you going to believe? You're going to believe the truth of the gospel? Here's what it is. You're a far worse sinner than you think. Your best day, you're like, man, woo! Dot and I's, cross and T's. I am a home run holy hitter. Still sinful. And the beauty of the gospel is, but you're more loved than you can ever imagine because the very blood of God would be spilt on your behalf. Who told you that? Jesus did. Jesus said it, and he delivered it. What have you done? I've made myself God. I've tried to save myself from rebelling from every rule so I could be king. Or I've tried to save myself from following every rule so I could be king. When we own it and we turn, we experience salvation. Now, please hear me. Our mission at Trope Church is to help people find their way back to God. That is literally, this is why I love this text. This is literally the text. That is the substructure of that mission. Because God is always coming near to the broken and ashamed and he's asking over and over, where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? That's when you first come to him and then 10 years down the line when you're like, man, I should probably get baptized, but I'm not. Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? Oh, I got a sexual addiction. What am I gonna do? Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? Marriage is on the rocks. going to be over. Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? Watch well, what that. No, 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 no. What have you done? What have you done? Are you seeing this? The reason why I love this is it's the first picture in the biblical story of God coming to sinners. And the way he comes to them is, yes, with judgment. But before judgment is an invitation to mercy. Confess. Come close. I want to heal you. And the way Adam and Eve respond is often the way we respond, and it's a dead end. God is pursuing you, friend, right now. He invites confession before he levies judgment. And humble confession, listen, humble confession shapes the judgment we experience. Confession is powerful. And of course, Jesus took the judgment of God for our sin in our lives. We'll talk about that Friday and Sunday, what God has done for us, not just the questions he 
asks of us. Let's pray. God, I ask right now in Jesus' name, I ask in Jesus' name that you would help us in this room to identify with your spirit working, what we're clinging to to save ourselves. Help us to see that safety is where God is and help us come to you. God, for the thousandth time, let us return to you again and again and again because you're the God who pursues. I pray for people right now in this room that you're pursuing. Holy Spirit, draw them to a place of confession and repentance, hope, and healing. God, we need you. Help us scrub our minds about who you are. You are the God who pursues. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name.